Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Thank you so much for being here tonight and to everyone who is engaging with us at home for our live streaming. We have a wonderful event for you tonight and presentation, uh, Helping Your Child Manage Anxiety. We have a wonderful present, uh, presenter, Dr. David Meichenbaum. He is a clinical child psychologist who specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of developmental and mental health disorders. He has worked at the Summit Center for over 15 years, where he serves as the clinical director of Summit's Behavioral Pediatrics Clinic, director of community consulting and clinical services, and the director of summer treatment programs. Dr. Meichenbaum is also a consultant and a trainer for educators. We often work with him in our schools, and he offers practical behavioral and educational strategies that focus on the social, emotional, adaptive, and behavioral development of students with autism spectrum and disruptive behavior disorders. We are so pleased to have him here with us tonight. Please give a warm welcome for Dr. David Meichenbaum. Thank you so much. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to come to this presentation today. As was mentioned, just by way of background, uh, my perspective is one as a licensed clinical psychologist. Um, I spend a lot of time within our clinic, as was noted, doing diagnostic evals, but also providing individual and family therapy for children, adolescents, meet with their parents for a lot of different types of conditions, but anxiety uh, also being included as one of them. In my day doing consultation around all the districts, all, not all the districts, I think we were contracted with 30 this school year, and helping teachers, we're often addressing behavior problems, but as we try to get to the bottom of behavior problems, it's not uncommon that anxiety may be a part or a factor in a lot of it. In fact, a third of children that have a diagnosable behavioral disorder also demonstrate some sort of concern related to anxiety. So anyways, I'm uh, looking forward to getting through this presentation here. I, I often don't make it all the way through. I'm going to tell myself that's okay. I'll get through what I can. Welcome to a presentation on anxiety, by the way. Um, there are different kinds of psychologists. You, you may know this. Uh, just for clarity, I'm what's called a cognitive behavioral psychologist. So I believe to the core, um, the way children, or any of us act for that matter, is influenced by the way we feel but it's often preceded by the way we think. And that becomes really important in, in, a, in a presentation on managing anxiety because I don't want to look past or look, ignore the importance of thinking patterns as how they play a role in anxiety. So I know it's not just with anxiety, but I know with a lot of the kids that I work with, those who tend to become angry, irritable, sad, anxious, we know they tend to have a slanted negative thinking pattern. You may have seen this operate when you say, hey, listen, we're going to try something new. And there's a prediction. It's called fortune telling. Like, no, it's going to be terrible, right? Or they may be catastrophizers when they make great big deals out of little deal types of issues. We have kids that discount the positives. They forget about past successes as they are about to do something starting or going again. We're good? Okay. So anyways, I'm going to speak a little bit more about thinking tendencies and thinking errors along the way. But uh, let me just say, I, I do like the fact that this, I don't think I named the presentation. Maybe I did. But as I was thinking about it, I like the title that it says, Manage Anxiety. This is not about having no anxiety. This is about managing anxiety. Because anxiety is a natural ex emotion. It's something that's bound to happen. And I think in a lot of cases, anxiety is not a terrible thing. In fact, anxiety can be rather, I'll come back to this, but anxiety can be rather helpful. It can be adaptive. It can alert us to concerns and, and get us prepared in situations where we should approach with caution and be fearful. There's something, I don't think it's an official term, but there's something I call the OZA. I, do, I provide some education to kids about their anxiety and the OZA, in my opinion, stands for the optimal zone of anxiety. Think of it this way, that, you know, I, I use the example of preparing for a test. And if we have the child that's highly, highly anxious, uh, they may struggle in preparation for that test, right? They're going to be too panicked. Oh my gosh, I'm going to fail. I'm going to bomb this whole thing. And that's going to interfere in their ability to sit down and study. 
And then we have the other person with no anxiety. Test? All right, that's my son, by the way. Hey, Owen, don't you think you should do any kind of studying? I got this, right? He's probably underperforming, to be honest. And then you have that optimal zone of anxiety. That is kids that, oh, I got a test, I got a study. So some anxiety is a good. It can motivate behavior in some respects. On the other hand, when our body reacts in a way that is disproportionate for what the situation happens to be, that's when we start to have some challenges and problems. And I do work with a series of kids that will actually meet diagnostic criteria, and I'll show you this in a second, for a diagnosable anxiety disorder. Now, I'm not here only to talk about individuals who meet criteria for one of these disorders that are up here, because to be honest, the criterion for being identified with anything is still very categorical. You have it or you don't have it. And that's just not the way any of this works. We are all on continuums of all of this in terms of how, you know, on the continuum of social confidence, there's some who are the social butterflies, just very comfortable everywhere. And then there's others, and I'm probably closer to this end, who's a little bit more reserved, uh, maybe a little bit more cautious and actually pretty content keeping to myself in a lot of ways. So these are continuums, and I'm not all about labels. Okay, a label doesn't always answer, so now what? What I'm more interested is where in your life are you having difficulty? And for that, we can come up with some sort of solution. Now, for those kids who are either identified as having anxiety disorder or were wondering whether my son, daughter, student is having some anxiety, there are a series of behavioral indicators that are worth paying attention to because some of these may be mis... Well, we should look for these and ask the question if anxiety plays a role. Um, the thoughts are the easiest one to determine. I mean, actually, I, easier is to understand if a child is anxious. It's sometimes hard to determine because I work with a lot of kids. Maybe you have a son, child that uh, is not very good at articulating their worries and their fears. I mean, for some, we'll say, no, I don't want to go, I'm scared. Or what will the teacher say? What will the students think? Um, you can hear those negative patterns. But there's a lot of children that have trouble articulating that, especially kids at a younger age, and it might just come through some sort of behavioral expression. Whether, and I highlighted the fifth one down here, often this can manifest itself as crying, irritability, tantrums. I said a few moments ago that a third of the children that end up having an identified behavioral disorder demonstrate signs of anxiety. In some cases, this is that chicken or egg kind of thing. What happens? Is it a child that is anxious and as a, at a loss of being able to express it elsewhere, it just comes out as behavioral concerns? That is a possibility, and I don't, disc I don't discount that at all. So you're going to see children that... You might see this through social withdrawal, avoidance of situations. Um, sometimes it comes out as classroom silliness. You might have kids that have a bunch of somatic symptoms. That is, you, they're commenting about the upset stomach or the tenseness. They have disruptive sleep as well. Again, my goal is not to review every bullet, but we should be paying attention to these signs and symptoms and at least ruling out whether anxiety might be a factor that's playing a role. Um, I know we're going to take questions at the end, but I don't mind being slowed down along the way too. So if anyone has any questions or comments about this, please, please slow me down. Um, okay, so the lifetime prevalence of having anxiety concerns is close to 10%. A 10% in just children alone, and I've mentioned this number already a few times, so 36% of children with behavioral issues. I put in a graph, it may be a little bit difficult for you to see, it's, it's in your handout as well, and it's just talking about individuals at different ages, those who experience depression, anxiety, and behavioral concerns. And one of the things that you can see in that middle graph is uh, between ages and 12, 12 to 17, anxiety prom problems are really prevalent. It's the most prevalent of any of the childhood disorders. Um, so again, it's deserving of our attention. I spend my day working a lot being a summit employee. We kind of tend to um, reach out, individuals reach out to our clinic for, who have a lot of different challenges, but autism being one of them, because I know we're certainly known in the community to support individuals with autism. Uh, 
40% of individuals with autism, so more than in the general population, will experience anxiety as well. So I'm going to touch briefly on this uh, because I don't know if anyone in here uh, has a child with autism or at home. Um, but it's worth considering a little bit why is this number higher for individuals with autism? Yes. Uh, so if I was to comment to that, and that is the question was, have I found or do I know if the pre prevalence of anxiety has been higher in the last three years? I don't know data. So if we're just talking about impression, uh, which I know is not the best thing to comment on here, I can tell you that us and a lot of places in the community have very, very long wait lists to be seen in clinics. Um, we can't keep up with the demand necessarily for consultation as well. And I don't discount uh, the social difficulties that a number have had as a result following COVID. That said, as if I was to transition to individuals with autism, a lot of my students with autism did fantastic during COVID. Not all, but some did. And the transition back to school has certainly been very stressful. Um, so I can't give you a specific data answer to that. I know I could find it though. Uh, my email, this is a good prompt by the way, my email is on every single slide um, or on the, every single page of the handout. I don't mind you reaching out with questions uh, in the days to come as you think about this. And if you were to email me that, I would definitely do my best to find the answer to that. Um, but why the higher prevalence of individuals with autism has to do with the diagnostic criterion itself. So if I was to do an evaluation with, uh, for an individual with autism, some of the criteria that I'm going to be evaluating is I know this is symptomatic of the disorder, is that there's this insistence on sameness. There's this desire to main rate teens. There's challenges with transition, strong attachment to different items. There's this reactivity to various sensory input, both positive and negative. And as you can go on and see the other items. Now, let's look at the triggers when we do evaluations of behavior challenges, I want to know the why. What is precipitating a lot of the behavior challenges? And if you start to look at this, these are the most common triggers that children with autism have difficulty with. These are, these are things that are certain to happen in society, that there's going to be unexpected changes. We have to try new things. There's going to be this unexpected exposure to this loud auditory stimuli. There's the, so much unpredictability and waiting and being told no. That is all of this stuff that's on here creates uncertainty. And how do we all do with uncertainty? I mean, to differing degrees, it causes stress. The reason I left this slide up here is that these items are not specific to just individuals with autism. This is specific to my wife. Now let me clarify what I mean by that. The intolerance of uncertainty, okay, is a real phenomenon. It is a, it's a characteristic. I just want to show you this. It's, I'm going to read what it is. Intolerance of, of uncertainty is this dispositional incapacity to endure the aversive response that can be triggered by perceived absence of salient key or sufficient information. In short, what does all that mean? The unknown can be unsettling. And yes, this slide here shows that individuals with autism are likely to have greater intolerance to uncertainty than, the, than those in the general population, that is, that uncertainty is going to more likely create an aversive response for them. But this is a continuum intolerance of uncertainty where we all fall on it some way. I better round out what I was saying about my wife rather than just leaving that hanging out there. Okay? This is what I meant by my wife with the intolerance of uncertainty. This is my one hesitancy why I want you to record this or not want you to record it and store it because I don't know how long this is, if this is going to get out. She doesn't know I tell this story yet, but... Um, so my wife has us go through an exercise every single Sunday night. I kind of think it's pointless, but I go with it. And that is, we have this nice, I don't know, chart paper she found in some gift shop, which is the days of the week. And she has me record on there every single event that we have each evening for the entire week. Now, the reason I think this is silly is because we have a shared calendar that you can look at on our phone and it's all right there. But we put that all on this page and we put out what's our dinner plan for the week. 
Now, again, I kind of think it's silly, but for her to see this visually in one place in front of her for the whole week, it's settling. So I go with it because that generally means, you know, you don't want to challenge that. So here's the idea. The idea is there are visual strategies. There's things we can do to create more settlement, not just for kids with autism, that can help us feel better. It, a lot of it falls with let's clarify as much of the uncertainty as possible. So a lot of the strategies that I'm going to be kind of talking about are ways you can help is let's clarify. Let's clarify expectations. Let's clarify ahead of the time how the world is going to respond. Let's clarify, if possible, how we should think about things. So the first part of the presentation was just to kind of highlight the presence of autism, or sorry, of anxiety and how it may manifest itself. I want to transition now to how we often respond, or most commonly respond. But does anyone have questions about any of this? No? Okay. So, I just want to throw caution, or call attention to the most conventional ways we respond to challenging behaviors and anxiety included. And um, just to maybe think about if this is the way, a way that you may respond. Um, I'm not going to say that it's problematic, uh, but it may not resolve the issue. So I'm going to give you a quick case example to um, describe this, um, to, to get us going on this. So let me tell you about Kai. Kai is a fourth grade student. When presented with a perceived challenging task, he becomes upset. He makes repeated negative comments. I can't do this. I'm not smart. This is too hard. And then he refuses the work. His teachers and parents have responded in the past by modifying his work, his homework, offering him assistance, providing reassurance, removing expectations, having him make up missed work, giving him rewards for completion, and offering him breaks when he's upset, whether it's let's go for a walk, let's take a sensory break, let's just take a chill out for a little while. Despite the various interventions that the adults have tried, both at home and at school, the team said to me that it feels like Groundhog Day with him. That despite what we do, the next time we sit down to do math or we do homework, we get the same responses. Now, this is rhetorical. You don't have to raise your hand, but just think about, do you have a Kai? I work with a lot of parents who will say that we talk to them, I tell them, I blew it until I'm blue in the face, I'm exhausted by how many times do I have to tell you, all of those things. Now just think about our responses. Our responses are designed or intended, I think, to, to increase the likelihood of positive behaviors and decrease the challenges. At least that's what the goal is supposed to be. I do want to say though, you all know your kids so well. Your student staff know him, her, them so well at this point. And as a result of knowing them so well, we often make a lot of accommodations. Accommodations to get us through the situation, to minimize stress for your son or daughter, to move us through the moment. And those accommodations could be a variety of things. It could be helping them avoid stressful situations. You know them so well that you can remove the expectations. You can rescue them when they're frustrated. You can provide reassurance. You can offer uh, preferred items and breaks to settle them down. You can take them on walks. Now, I know a lot of these things sound positive. Like, these are all probably parts of best practice solutions, but one thing I just want to consider here is that the first item in every one of those lines there could be considered a verb. And all that tells me is, is that if it's a verb, these are things that you're doing, which means your son, daughter, child may not be doing that for themselves, which necessitates adult assistance. So, you know, I, I think there has to be this appreciation that every accommodation that you provide a student, a child, and every prompt you provide is being done because the child is not doing something. So if we want to get out of this cycle of repeatedly doing, when is this all going to stop? It stops when your child is able to do a skill. In fact, I believe to the core that every single challenging behavior that happens in this world 
is because something more appropriate is not. So when I hear of teams use words like, hey, we're walking on eggshells. We don't want to poke the bear. We don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to wake the lion, right? When we hear all of those words, what does that mean to me? It means we're trying to set up an environment that is just perfect, stress-free, which I get. Listen, I have three children of my own. They're all grown, so things are way less stressful now. But I know how chaotic and challenging things can be, and it's important to maintain peace and order. So we have to accommodate and set up. But just know if when we're walking on those eggshells and hoping that there is no problem, what we're also not doing is setting up a child for the reality that there is going to be an unexpected change at some point. I'll give you, I, I, let me finish off that particular example. Okay, I don't know, I see a few educators in here. I don't know if any of them lived it. But the support for uh, students that desire predictability, okay? Certainly students with autism. One of the recommendations is let's create visual schedules. Visual schedules can be accommodating for them as it creates predictability, and that can be very comforting. I do a lot of presentations to teachers. I've asked this question many times. I already know the response because I consult in situations like this, where I've said to the staff, hey, have any of you, actually parents use visual schedules too, so you may have lived this. Where, where your day is laid out, everything's going well, and all of a sudden, the classroom phone rings. And who is it? It's the OT. And the OTs call up and says, hey, you know what? I'm not going to be able to service Kai before lunch. I got to come after lunch because I'm stuck at this other building. And what does the classroom teacher says? They say, like, are you sure about that? And they're like, yeah. And you're like, oh my gosh, great. And then you hang up, you look at the classroom aide and say, who's going to tell Kai? Because say to Kai, guess what, Kai? No OT today. Good luck. Deal with that. That, that could be very challenging for him. And the thing is, by us creating this predictability, what we're also doing with the visual schedule is we're trying to accommodate them by giving the predictability and then hope for no change. If that's the plan, then the idea of a visual schedule in and of itself is not very accommodating. It's actually what I call an unaccommodating accommodation. Because it is not preparing a child for a necessary skill that they need in life, and that is life is unpredictable. We need a response for that. Now, if you want to hear my response for that, maybe I have it as a case example later on. Maybe we'll get to that. If not, I'm happy to tell you just afterwards if this applies to you. Okay, so questions about that? So sometimes our own responses are just not even getting at the solution, I guess I'm trying to say. Walks, sensory breaks. You may have encouraged teams to like, hey, just give my child a walk. Certainly schools figure this out. Like, hey, we can calm the situation down with a walk. Okay? Just so you know my impression or my general feeling is I feel like there's way too many kids walking around school buildings today. Now, this is not to say that there's not an appropriate place for a walk. Okay? Let me explain the situation I'm talking about. Uh, I was about to see a child in my clinic. Uh, the school team knew he was coming. They called me up uh, prior to him coming in and said, Dave, just want you to know we're having some troubles. We're having some difficulties with Ryan. I mean, he's getting upset. We're offering him walks, um, but they're not working. In fact, today he ended up getting uh, suspended. So Ryan is fortunately someone who can articulate his thoughts, his feelings, all of that. So I ended up saying to Ryan when he came on in, I was like, Ryan, so what ended up happening? And so he had some sort of altercation with a peer in this particular class. And then he was told to go for a walk. And so I started to ask him, hey, can you tell me a little bit about, like, what were you thinking about when you went on that walk? And the first comment is, how could that kid do that to me? And as you went around this corner, what were you thinking about? How embarrassing. And when you went around this corner, what were you thinking about? All the kids were laughing. And what were you thinking about when you went around this corner? If he does it again, I'm going after him. Well, he misinterprets a cue as he goes in there. Next thing you know, he's going after him. And as a result of that, he's on in-school suspension. So 
I'm not here to say don't do walks because if they're working, great. But if the entire time the child is perseverating and ruminating, having some sort of negative thinking pattern about the experience, it's not necessarily about up here. What about when you present uh, a difficult work, time to do homework, child has an epic meltdown, go take a break. But if they're not going to think any differently about homework, it's awful, it's too hard, it's going to take forever, which are all false but negative thinking patterns, right? Nothing takes forever. It may take a while, but also let's not ignore the role that asking for help can take. There's ways to change the thinking patterns for this. Uh, my, my concern for walks uh, are also relates to kids who are doing it four or five times a day. Yes, it de-escalates the situation, but what it's not looking at is, why does that child have to leave the class four or five times a day? Taking the walk isn't what we need to work on. We need to work on how do you de-escalate in the classroom. Now, this takes time to build skills, so I get it that, you know, the walk might be necessary to, you know, for a lot of different reasons. But um, anyways, I just wanted to say that walks in and of themselves may just be limiting at getting at, at a solution. Okay. And then we can't ignore, and this is kind of like the, the role that walks have as well in some cases, is that, you know, whenever I'm faced with dressing challenging behaviors, you always want to look at how does that behavior relate to its environment? So the A's in this case is those triggers. What are the antecedents, the things that come before the panic, right? Um, for I met with a team today about a child who has school avoidance. Okay, so pulling on up to the school, seeing the school, that, that's a trigger for this particular child. That's the antecedent. And then the behaviors, well, usually why I get called in. And then there's the C's. That's what follows. Now, it stands for consequences, but consequences aren't always punitive, like go to your room or you have red light. Consequences is just how the world responds following it. And what we, it's important for us to ignore, particularly with anxiety, is, is that C, the consequence, does it actually serve a function that's meaningful for this child. For instance, hey, time for homework. Here comes a meltdown response. Now, as a result, hey, we're just not going to do homework today. Now, I'm not saying you should push through the meltdown, by the way, okay? But what I just wanted to point out for this example is that removal allows this child to alleviate his anxiety and his stress about the situation. If that feels good, then that is what's called, not feels good to you, feels good to that child, that serves as what we call a potential maintaining consequence. That is, it's going to increase the likelihood of that problematic behavior happening again and again and again. And often anxious symptoms, not the symptoms in terms of the panic and uh, the rapid heartbeat and all of that, but I'm talking about the behavioral manifestation is sometimes increasingly likely because it serves a function, a purpose. When will that temper tantrum stop? Well, it's going to stop when it's no longer effective. And when that child realizes it's no longer effective, he's going to realize, or she or they, or is going to realize it's inefficient, meaning it's not enough. And once they figure then something else out, because they will try something else out, they're just not going to be like, oh, I guess that didn't work okay, I'm ready to do homework right now, they're going to figure out something else. When they figure out there's something else, then that initial behavior, it becomes irrelevant. My question for when I work with teams often is, how does your student or child figure out there's something else? They're going to need some guidance, some instruction in order to be able to come up with that other behavior that they should do instead of that behavioral episode, say, or biting their hands, or screaming, or whatever else it happens to be. So I actually spend quite a bit of time with teams trying to develop what we call adaptive alternative behaviors. Uh, I don't want to turn this into a whole behavioral presentation. I'm trying to keep the focus on anxiety. But let me tell you this. If you have a child that demonstrates behavioral concerns, I want to hear about them. Uh, I listen to teams of teachers all the time describe behavioral concerns. The most important question I think that can be asked, so you should ask this of your own situation, the number one question I ask 
is okay. So what behavior is not occurring? That, in my opinion, becomes the most important question to ask because every behavioral challenge in this world is happening because something more appropriate isn't. Once we name it, we can give some consideration how to build it and support the demonstration and reinforce the demonstration of that skill. Okay. All right, questions about our, our responses that might maintain anxious reactions? Listen, I could probably do an hour on each one of these sections. I know I'm trying to kind of hit on some key points, touch on some key points, um, and get to some solutions. Um, I said mindset matters, and uh, I believe to the core this relationship, just as a for instance, uh, here's a child that we can talk, think about it positively. By the way, I know a lot of schools are adopting things like growth mindset. I love that, by the way. This is cognitive psychology and brought into the school setting about thinking about positive, can-do kind of statements. It's, it's great. Um, but, you know, let's think of this as a homework or a math problem that generally creates anxiety and stress. Should you approach it with a, hey, I got this, you're going to feel more confident, you're going to begin the work. Alternatively, more likely the, the mindset of a child who becomes anxious is going to be a little bit more negatively loaded and question their ability. And of course, if you feel I can't, that's going to create anxiety and at loss of not knowing what else to do. We're not born, by the way, knowing how to manage anxiety. That, that's an important point to make as well. We're not born knowing how to manage anxiety. It is a learned skill. And how is it generally learned? If Unless you're providing uh, direct instruction, which kind of does happen, right? Like through the years, most of us learn the skill because we talk about it. There's different instances around us and at home and in daycare and in preschool. And we see what happens over there to little Johnny or to whoever. And, oh, this is the feedback that Darius gets. And I get, I learn when I hear that and I see that. And a lot of kids learn that way. Not all kids, though. I mean, if you're an ADHD child who's so in the moment, inattentive, you're a child with autism, not keenly aware of your social environment, it is possible that you're not learning the skill in the same way as everyone else. Think about your own responses, too. Okay, I'm absolutely not pinning anxiety on parents' reactions. Okay, but there is an association in some cases for kids. If the modeled example is one of getting overwhelmed and stressed. I mean, there's a good association with specific phobias. Uh, not all, but some specific phobias. Think about your reaction to spiders, and then think about, I mean, I'm thinking about my daughter's reaction to spiders right now. Now, it's not to the level of impairment, but I'm telling you, she does not touch them. I get called no matter where I am. She'll trap it. She'll wait for me to take care of it. And I'm like, your mom is right here. She's like, oh, I just got to stop telling these mom stories. My wife is great, by the way. She's a fantastic fifth grade special ed teacher. She does not like the spiders, though. So anyways, some of this behavior becomes a little bit learned in some way, or it's not learned the appropriate way. So thinking definitely matters here. Um, and by the way, these thinking patterns become habitual. By this age, whatever age your child is, 7, 14, 18, if they have a slanted negative thinking pattern, it's probably well ingrained. It's automatic. It's probably go-to. It's habit. It's reflex. And in some ways, it may work. Throwing a big of enough fit kind of gets me out of it. Now, this is not to say that it can't be changed because all habits can be changed. But it takes some time. It takes Understanding, it takes desire, it takes a plan, it takes daily attention to that plan, but there's ways to certainly do this. On this slide is just some of those negative thinking errors, the most common ones. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I do think for the kids that can handle it, some of the best practices in treating anxiety disorders is understanding what's going on, what's going on with your body, what's accounting for this. Now, this is tricky. You can't do this with all kids. They're not quite at the level to be able to have this understanding. But for many, when they're ready, understanding of what's going on with anxiety is important. Psychoeducation or education is a big part of it. 
There are some evidence-based manuals out there that talk about labeling your anxiety, like let's call it my worry bully, and now you know what's happening. Um, So a lot of the best practices uh, for anxiety lies in the world of cognitive behavioral treatments. Um, There's wide amounts of evidence talking and establishing its effectiveness. It's effective at different ages. It's effective certainly in children. There's even data that indicates its effectiveness with individuals with autism as well. Um, If you're not familiar with CBT or you probably heard elements of it, these are some of the core elements associated with cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because, sure, you may have some children that their anxiety goes to the level that, hey, they are going to need some additional counseling support, whether it be in school or out of school. And there are folks trained that can walk them through this. But the real reason I'm telling you all of this, well, I want to tell you it for that reason. But the other reason is I do know the majority of people, for a variety of different kind of reasons and barriers, will not go to a therapist for cognitive behavioral therapy. So knowing the elements that are involved, we got to figure out how we can bring this support to where they are at, to their homes, to their schools, to their classrooms. When I consult in schools, I know that the majority of these kids are not going to get CBT. This is why I get excited. Oh my gosh, they got a building-wide program related to growth mindset. That's amazing. And they have various skills of the, of the month, if not week or day, that they're doing that's working on how to understand feelings and express feelings. By the way, your district is doing an amazing job at this. Uh, I consult in a number of the elementary schools, and I've definitely been impressed with some of the skills training that I've seen go on uh, at the building-wide level. Okay, so education... There does take skills training, and the reason for the skills training is every single inappropriate response is happening because something more appropriate isn't. And we got to ask ourselves, is that more appropriate thing? Just for examples, recognizing and expressing my feelings, uh, asserting myself, uh, thinking positively. We're not born knowing how to do those skills again, so there is some skills training that can go on with that. No, you've heard to some different extents this world of mindfulness, and uh, perhaps some of you are are practicing that yourself because there's great amounts of evidence it's working. Worry requires attention. Worry requires focus. And in some cases, it's perseverative focus that you are just focusing on all the time. Mindfulness activities can sometimes separate us from that stressful focus. So too can distraction, by the way. I don't mind breaks. I don't mind a walk. I don't mind, you know, five minutes on the iPad time at some, in some cases to separate myself from the intensity of my worry, to take it from a 10 down to a five so now I can employ other kinds of calming and relaxation strategies as well. Um, so behavioral reinforcement, I'm going to just touch on that one real quickly. The adaptive alternative response, the more appropriate behavior we want them to do, remember, It's not reflexive right now, meaning it's going to be effortful. You want them to take deep breaths. You want them to move on. You want them to let it go, right? You want them to not worry. You want them to use self-reassurance. But those skills, if they're not solidly part of their repertoire, they're not going to just do it for do its sake. The first most often question I ask on any consultation, as I said, was, so what behavior is not occurring? We got to name it. Once we name it, we can build it. The second most often question I ask on any consultation is, why should they? What I mean by that is, why should they do that more appropriate thing? And if your response is kind of my response to my own three kids at home, if they all looked up me, at me and one of them came up to me and says, Dad, why should I do that? Oh, it's because I said so. You do as you're told. But that's not how it's going to work for individuals with anxiety. Because the adaptive alternative, this regulatory strategy, is going to be effortful. So let me just wrap this up by saying that some sort of behavioral reinforcement, I'm not talking bribing, but some sort of behavioral reinforcement to celebrate their success in doing the more appropriate thing, taking a break, giving it a shot, getting started, whatever that first step towards the end goal, whatever that is, that needs to be celebrated. 
another part of behavioral parent training associated with this and, and part of behavioral reinforcement, I suppose, is something called behavioral shaping. I draw ladders all the time in my office. This, is, this next point is just to have a, a mind, mindset kind of reset for you guys about thinking about your child. The reason I draw ladders is at the top of the ladder is your hope, your expectation. I will never compromise and think you should compromise from whatever that happens to be. Hey, you should do your work. You should do as I say. You should follow your rules. You should be respectful. You should help out around the house. Hey, all of that stuff. But I'm telling you, these are all top of the ladder goals. And the reason I'm saying it's a ladder is since I haven't met any of your children, I'm going to put your child right here on the floor. Only to represent that there is no way to get where they're at to the top of the ladder. Be nice to your sister. Be good. Follow directions. Get ready for bed the time I tell you. There's no way to get there unless you take a step. And then another step. And then another step. And so this idea is what's called behavioral shaping. And by creating doable steps, you have a better chance of creating success. This is really critical for fear-based anxieties. Okay? Child trouble going to school. I have a number, two kids I'm working on right now that don't want to be upstairs in their room or upstairs at all because of fear and the separation anxiety concerns. Which, by the way, I may not have put separation anxiety on that list of anxiety disorders. I probably should have. That's an important one. So, how do you get there? You try it a little bit. The best behavior plans in this world, this is obvious, are ones that do not fail. Of course. But we have to create them in a way that your children cannot fail. Because if the step is too great, what are we bound to be talking about? The failure. It not working. And kids sense that. And when you fail so many times, one of two things is going to happen. It's, you already have an anxious child who now is going to have a profound impact on their self-esteem because you know things are not going, parents are upset. They notice all of that stuff. Or you have the other child, which you may have, and that is you get these hardened kids that, that stop giving a crap. You have a consequence for them. I don't care. I don't care. You can't take away anything else from them anymore without getting that response. I don't care. Well, I don't buy it for a second that they don't care. What I buy is that that response of saying I don't care is very adaptive. It pays to not care because if I was to care... This is almost too much for me to bear. So anyways, try to adapt a laddered approach of trying to set your kids up for success by setting realistic goals and expectations. Baby steps, I guess, is another way to say that. Okay. A um, few other tips. I should have put adopt behavioral shaping on here. Um, but uh, definitely, as best as possible, model the non-anxious responses, whether that is you doing the infinity breathing breaths with them. Try, I know this is easier said than done, okay? We all get filled up. I'm, I fly off the handle for sure at home, okay? But as best as possible, especially if we're trying to teach the, the, the positive coping strategies. The second one is really key too, because a lot of the times what we're paying attention to, or what, when I'm having a school consultation, what are we talking about, is the challenging behaviors. But these meltdowns aren't happening daily. In fact, I have some parents that will say, listen, it's been a, a pretty good two weeks. Oh, did he deal with any stressors? No, no, it just was a good couple weeks. Well, I don't buy that for a second either. Every day is stressful. There's times that, you know, your brother cuts in front of you and gets to go first, right? We ask you to try something new and you let it go, right? You fell down, you hurt your knee and you just kind of, just kind of moved on. And what I think is particularly important for kids with anxiety is don't ignore those moments. Because whatever they did in a lot of those moments is what's needed to get through the bigger moment. So when they say and make a lot of I can't statements or it's going to be impossible, they need to see all the instances that they did. So I think that part is pretty important. Positively attend to and reinforce non-anxious responses. Number three. 
a lot of the challenges with dealing with anxiety and doing our plans is because they don't know it's time to do the plan. Almost step one in every single self-regulatory strategy is recognize it's time to do that. Feeling recognition is tricky, not impossible, and it's difficult at young ages, but there's things we can do to support a child in doing it. So one of the simplest ways to do it that I would encourage you to, to, to do if you're not already is label what you see, label what you hear and point it out. Hey, Michael, I can see by your grunting that you're getting frustrated. Or Megan, I can see by you like banging on the table that you're, you're getting really stressed. That right there does two things. For a child who doesn't know what anger, stress, frustrated, shy, all that happens to be, it's an opportunity for them to be like, oh, that's what it looks like, these, these behavioral signs, so it helps there. But the other way it will help you out is a lot of negative behavioral expression is designed to communicate to you guys, listen, I'm scared, I'm pissed, I'm angry. So what happens is you can take the winds out of the sails of behavioral escalation by pointing out what you see and that you get it earlier on. So you can say, hey, I can see that. Listen, I know turning off my electronics to have to go do something else is pretty tough. You may not have to get the full-blown tantrum because, well, you got it. You get it. So that, I think, is pretty important. Uh, Model the coping skills, not just the non-anxious responses. And then, I don't know, I I saw this somewhere, and I'm guilty of overbooking kids. But at some point, I don't want to rule out the importance of just decompression time because your kids are on literally five to seven hours a day in school and after school program. And listen, I don't know about you. I have a lot of kids I work with that get through the school day and the parents are like, he's fine at school. And you guys get the brunt. And uh, there is a researcher in the world of uh, autism. His name's uh, Dr. Tony Atwood. Uh, I don't know if any of you know of him, but he does describe the sunsetting effect. And that is kids that kind of hold it together all day long. They are rule followers, not trying to be bad. But hey, I draw this emotional tank on my wall all the time. When kids come on in, I say, what's filling you up? And by the end of the day, I don't doubt that your kids are filled up, that the littlest things now can just have it overflow. So I I love the idea of uh, being in activities, uh, but just you know how to manage whether it's too much or not for your children. Okay, yeah, pause. Let's uh, have some questions, and then I have a few uh, specific additional tools and strategies. Yeah. Ooh, okay, that's a good one. So let's think about this. I'm going to see if I can repeat this. Um, so I did say label. First of all, okay, so I said it could be helpful to label emotions. I actually said do it, okay? Let me temper that all my solutions, probably there's some caveats when not to do it. But would you label the emotion in someone that has a verbal tick, was it? A motor tick? A verbal tick, where you've been actually advised to just ignore it. On the other hand, you mentioned that you have seen it be a precursor, that is the tick, to this child feeling even worse about themselves, right? Are you guys going for a solution to curtail the ticks, or is the idea right now is that it's going to just dissipate with ignoring? Okay. Because that's what I, my thought is. is like, listen, we, ignoring is something that you can try. You don't have to try very long. We probably know, like we could have a condition where we just pay no attention for two weeks and let's see if it actually dissipates. I'm in generally... In general, now I have never thought it was specific in tick disorder. I'm in general not a fan of planned ignoring. Okay? Now I say that and I ignore my own kids all the time. But what I'm trying to say is this, is that when you ignore a child, it's really what we're trying to say is, don't do that. I'm going to ignore you so you can figure something else out. The thing we want them to do when we ignore is generally something more positive. Right? I, I, rem- I shared this example in schools before. First kid I'm working with at Summit. It's a four-year-old with autism, working with his uh, early intervention specialist, or, or no, um, uh, what is it, see it. It's 
especially a itinerant teacher. Child gets really upset, swipes everything off of his desk. See, it ignores. I'm the consultant to this case. I'm like, great decision, right? You ignored them. That's exactly what I would do. I spent my world before this working with kids with disruptive behavior disorders, planned ignorings on the list for kids with ADHD. But then what ended up happening is after she ignored, uh, the child a moment later stood up. This is a four-year-old. I don't think I'm going to do this right now. Oh, I will. Stood up on his chair like this. And at that point, I'm like a consultant. So I'm like, let me start consulting. This is great. So here I am under my breath saying to her, hey, he's all right. He's okay. Just ignore him. So we ignore him. And then what does he do? He stands up on this part of the chair. Now, here I was, just came out of graduate school. I know about planned ignoring. So what am I saying? I'm saying under my breath, hey, he's all right. He's okay. The chair's against the wall. He's hanging out of the wall. The mom told me he goes to roly polies. He's a star student there. He's got great motorcade coordination. He's totally good. You got him if he falls that way? Okay. I got him if he falls this way. Just ignore him. We continue to ignore. What's the next thing he does? He's standing up there. He didn't fall. He has great motor coordination, but he's now starting to take down his pants. I can't be alone in a room with a four year old and two adults as he's doing this. He's kept down, pants are kept up. This isn't about winning or losing, but what does this kid begin to realize? Wait, when I want to get out of something, I'm not going to risk my life standing up there anymore. I'm just going to go Yahoo, right, and pull down my pants. It's at that point I restart this whole thing about ignoring. When you ignore a child, it's basically saying, don't do that, do something else. But the question is, does the child know what else they're supposed to do? And is that thing even solidly part of their behavioral repertoire? This guy did that because he didn't know how to request for assistance, wait for assistance, request a break, wait for a break, try something new, get started. We're not born knowing how to do any of those skills. I can tell you some kids with intellectual or developmental disabilities, certainly kids with autism, have skill acquisition deficits. So how, I'm sorry to go on the tangent, but with, your, with the child that you're describing over here, Tick disorders are tricky, I know. And by the way, paying greater attention is demonstrated that it can increase it, for sure. But if we are working on a tool or strategy, if this is anxiety-based and they should be doing something else, then I would not expect that uh, uh, just ignoring is going to make it go away. I might want to just give gentle attention to our plan. Hey, buddy, like, let them know that this is it. You're seeing their early warning signs. By the way, if you ignore, uh, if you use planned ignoring, in a lot of cases, what do we do? We ignore the early warning signs and red flags. And what are we attending to? Now the fully escalated behavior. What have we just now done? We've increased the likelihood that the easy stuff to help out during, it's now we're reinforcing the full-blown meltdown. So I don't know. If you want to talk that one more through, uh, later on, we can. Um, I do think some labeling of emotion may actually be helpful. It's more to label, it's time for the plan. Okay. Uh, let me hit a, a few strategies. As you can see, uh, we're not getting to all eight here. Uh, this, I, I could talk about all this all day, but uh, I want to give you a few uh, instances of a few things that I think are important to try. Uh, I say to teachers, one of the best things that you can do is clarify times three. Clarify expectations, clarify the length of your rope, that is how many chances, and clarify exactly how their world is going to respond. For a child with autism, clarification is so important, and not just for kids with anxiety disorders. I want to tell you a quick, quick story about uh, my three kids at home. None have a diagnosable anxiety disorder. They all vary on the continuum of anxiety. When they were, and there's quite an age gap in my kids, but uh, my son and daughter, my youngest two, are separated by one grade. So I, it was the summer where uh, my oldest daughter was going to middle school. My son was going to elementary school, and my youngest daughter was about to go to preschool for the first time without her big brother, Oe, who's always been there with her in daycare and preschool. We start to have this discussion one day in the summertime about uh, the transitions that they're all going through. And it was interesting to see how all three handled this differently. So my oldest daughter, she was nervous. She was definitely nervous. The biggest thing kids are, I don't mean, I, she was nervous about is, am I going to have someone to sit with at lunch and who am I going to sit with in this middle school cafeteria? And we provided reassurance in a lot of different ways and described as much as you're concerned about how much different is at your new school Let's point out all the things that are the same. 
And there is this familiar person and this same role of this person and here's what you do and they get to walk the halls and all that familiarity helped ease her anxiety. My son, on the other hand, zero anxiety. He got his backpack in summer shopping and I think he wore it all summer long. Like he was rearing, ready to go. But it was my youngest daughter, Leah. When she realized that her brother was not going to be there, I, I'm telling you, she was inconsolable. She was so anxious, so sad. I wanted to reason and try and explain she wasn't listening to me at all. And I started to selfishly think about what am I going to be the person that has to do the day after Labor Day? I'm going to be the one that's going to have to drop her off at daycare. And I don't know if any of you've lived that moment, that terrible, terrible moment where you drop off your child at school and they cling on to you and they, you know, the tears are there, the daycare preschool staff comes and removes them from you and the child's crying and they're like, she's, she's going to be fine, she's going to be fine. You walk out, you're not feeling good about this. You make the mistake to look back and her face is pressed up against the window with the crocodile tears, right? You feel crappy all day long. You come back at the end of the day. They say she was fine once you left, but you don't believe them. That's what I wanted to avoid. So I needed a solution. So what did I do? I created a social story for her. Now, I don't know if you are familiar with social stories, but social stories are a great tool. We talk about utilizing them all the time for kids with autism. I write them for my kids with autism. Why wouldn't I write them for my own children? It's just a way to clarify and make more permanent the speech I'm going to have with her. You know, I did a little bit of research for a similar presentation to this a couple um, months or a couple weeks ago. One of the things I heard is that kids on average hear between 20 to 30,000 words a day. In the best of cases, kids only retain 17%. So you know all those heart-to-hearts and lectures and the reassurance. You say, buddy, you got to see it wasn't anything worried about. That's all nice and dandy. But in more cases, they may hear you and not attend to you, meaning it goes in one ear and out the other. So what we need to do is make some of these lessons more permanent, more concrete, something you can draw from. And if it's in a repetitive fashion, they can internalize it. It doesn't have to be a book. I met an amazing, amazing music therapist today who turns it all into songs. Songs are perfect for kids, how repetitive things happen to be. But hey, let me show you real quickly. This was my daughter's social story that I ended up writing uh, prior to her going to... um, uh, preschool without her brother there. Um, I, we developed this and I am telling you, she loved this story so much that she was reading it like every day of the summer. She was literally going around the neighborhood saying to kids like, I got a book. You don't have a book. Uh huh. So like it totally worked. We had to work on bragging, boasting later on, but nonetheless. All right. Pre-K, here I come. An exciting story about Leah and her preschool by daddy. I go to Clarence, uh, blah, 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 and so do my friends. Preschool is fun. We go on field trips. We play outside. Dude, we had... Dude, I don't know why I just said that. This is to her. We had... I'm getting tired here. But we had the preschool routine down. But in that moment of perseverative focus of brother being gone, she lost sight of all the things she loved about daycare. This is discounting the positive, right? So we put that into the book. Remind her about routine. I get a drive to preschool. When I'm there, I'm brave. I've been brave lots of times. I give us a hug. We wave goodbye, blah, blah, blah. I walk to school. All these things happen. Here's more of the activities. At the end of the day, we come get her. Before I go home, oh, get signed out. Everyone's proud of me. They give me hugs when I get home. Uh, They're proud of me because I'm a big girl now. I can go to preschool all by myself. I am telling you the first day on the drive to preschool, this is exactly how things went. We're driving, we're about halfway there, we're by the coffee shop. I'm like saying, hey, Leah, we're on our way, right? Do you need a tissue for your tears? And she's like, no, dad, I'm not crying. And then we're like three quarters of the way. And I'm like, hey, do you need a tissue for your tears? She's like, dad, you PKers don't cry. And then all of a sudden we're pulling in the driveway. I'm like, okay, here we are. Here's the tissue for your tears. She's like, dad, I'm not crying. I'm a big girl now. I'm like, oh my God, I need the tissue, right? Like what happened to the time and the years? So my point is, this is all about familiarity of expectations. The more you can clarify ahead of time, know what you're avoiding. You're avoiding them coming up with their own scary conclusions. And that is the thinking error that happens with a lot of kids with autism, or not autism, kids with anxiety for that matter. So Social stories can be helpful to clarify everything that I just worked on, um, described, to build confidence, to build rehearsal, to influence positive thinking for sure. So 
I just wanted to mention um, that clarity. It doesn't have to be in the story, but the more permanent you can make it, I think, the better. The next example is similar in trying to build... Guys, there was, I could have talked so many different strategies, certainly about relaxation and coping. I'm, I'm just offering, because of time, the, the ones to help build more positive thinkers right now. And uh, I want to talk uh, quickly about Kai, because I gave that example without telling you what we did. Kai was that negative thinker that, when presented with certain things, made a lot of negative comments that got in the way of them being able to perform. Uh, math, by the way was the biggest challenge. I actually, this was one of my consult cases. I go to observe this child filled with, I can't, math is too hard, I'm not good at it, all of this stuff. But teachers like they do, they get through it. They worked with him, they got him through his math. This teacher always will get him through his math despite all of those negative comments. And on this particular day, the teacher said, wow, that went a lot better than I expected. And my comment was, well, that's great that you noticed this. But I'll tell you what, it's even more important that Kai notices this. So one of the things I asked her to do is, hey, what I would do is when you get through something successfully, have him make a positive concluding statement about it. To which the teacher said, say something positive about math? There is no way he's going to say something positive about math. I don't even know if he can come up with anything positive about math. And I said, okay, let's set this up in a way where he cannot fail. So let's instead present him, because I get it. He's not going to say, I love math. But instead, let's present him with a forced choice, I'll come back to this, of maybe three or four different thought bubbles, if he can read, that we can present him with. Things like, hey, Kai, how'd you feel about math today? That was not so bad. I did it. That was easier than I thought. Asking for help helped. After he started identifying some of those, we added a few other ones. Now, my comment was, have him make a positive concluding statement. I suggested this idea. I had to leave, so I can't take credit for the next thing. I said to the teacher, now that he's made it, he now needs to bank that somewhere. Meaning, he needs to take that comment so he can draw from it again in the future. And, and this becomes, this is the permanent product. This is so much better than when we, um, you get a child through his homework or you get him through math at school and you say, hey, see, buddy, that wasn't so bad, right? We got it. No, I think that reassurance is really good. But remember, not going to attend to everything. So is that child going to draw from it in the future? So that's what I wanted him, but I meant by banking it. He, we need to have him draw from it in the future. So what ends up happening is I come back a couple weeks later. This was brilliant. I don't have a picture of it. I just literally tried to recreate it, but it's not even close to what the teacher had. She had this giant laminated brain for this second grader that was on her, on her wall. And sure enough, when I was there, he started making negative comments. It's like, not math, I can't do it. And she said, hey, Kai, let's go to our memory bank. And sitting in that brain were all of those positive thought bubbles that he had recorded in the past. So what does it show? It shows that comment that I can't. I'm not smart enough to do it. It's factually untrue. So whenever possible, I think a good cognitive strategy is to try to make permanent some of these, um, <clears throat> some of their um, uh, positive concluding statements. Uh, whether you have a journal, whether you have a page, whether you have a memory bank like they ended up indicating there. Right? I know I'm racing. I'm, I, I want to hear your comments and questions. Um, I'm going to present uh, two more. Um, these are both short. Uh, just two other kinds of uh, creative solutions um, that may be helpful to some respect. Um, the next one has to do something called check and reflex. Uh, Again, kind of in the principle of discounting positives and making uh, non-evidence-based conclusions, kids making conclusions that aren't based on the facts. Um, So uh, Jordan is someone I saw in my clinic, sixth grade student, has been described as being a very rigid and concrete thinker. Jordan's perseverated on the notion that his PE teacher does not like him. Jordan and his mother have asked for him to be removed from his general education PE class. Now, I tried. I tried multiple ways for like two, three sessions and getting Jordan to kind of see the positives. And 
I was not successful. Each session, they were trying to make the case that, uh, look, can I write the justification, a medical justification that he should be removed from that PE teacher in that PE class. And um, I had one last shot. And what I decided to do is I said to Jordan, um, instead of thinking about this PE teacher, because it was clearly perseverative and ruminating, I wasn't going to convince him otherwise about this PE teacher. I said, can you instead tell me about the teachers you think are good, the teachers you like? And he started to identify six, seven characteristics of the teachers he liked. So then when I said to him, I was like, okay, hey, Jordan, can you can you be my little detective here? And just, you know, for this next couple classes in PE, just tell me how this teacher does with these things. We set them up as dichotomous questions. They're either you did it or you didn't do it. Now, I know the PE teacher, okay? I think she's a great PE teacher. So I wasn't really buying what Jordan was saying, but I got on the phone with that PE teacher and I said, hey, Megan, guess what? You got one shot with this student. You see the things on this list? You better do it. To which she said, Dave, I do all of these things. I said, I know that. I didn't doubt that. But he's not noticing that. So what we did is at the end of this phys ed class, I don't know if you guys can make this out here. And to be honest, I can't tell you how, if this is totally clear or not, but it uh, looks fuzzy to me. But it was okay? All right, we'll make do. All right. Um, but here were the questions. So for concrete thinkers, it was... Well, you guys can see them. Did my teachers greet me? Did my teachers have a conversation with me? Did teachers have a, give me a compliment? And basically what we were setting up is, is there's a final question at the end of these check and reflects that is based on the algorithm. The algorithm, the algorithm is in this case is if everything in this column is circled, then you don't even have to answer the last question. The last answer question answers itself that yes, this was a supportive teacher. So what ends up happening is this kid comes back two weeks later, he has four of these completed and it changed his whole narrative about phys ed as he was now attending and making the conclusion, oh, this is a good teacher. I have since developed these types of checks and reflects for so many different types of things to help kids see the evidence. The top one, do my parents love me? I've heard that multiple times. My parents don't love me. What is love? I don't know. I may even have that one here. And, uh, and the child, after that, they said, well, this is how I think parents should show this is an example of love. And so this might turn out to be a little bit too small. But, uh, oh yeah, it's going to be a little bit tiny. But nonetheless... What happened is he identified, did my parents give me a hug? Did they spend time with me? It was, there was a ton of different items. And again, if they all highlight on the left-hand side, do my parents love me? Oh, I guess they do. So again, I went to the parents. I was like, listen, guys, you got, you got one shot this week. You better do these things in here. And they're like, Dave, we do this all the time. Exactly. The child just wasn't noticing it. So again, that's a big part of anxiety is not attending and noticing the positives. You can see up there that I use these for all different kinds of things. Evaluating your school day. Uh, I started my morning off today trying to help a kid that has a strong school avoidance. Um, they do get them into school occasionally, but the conclusions is that school is terrible. And they're like, that's not what his affect really demonstrates. And he has lots of things that we're proud of. So, you know, we're setting up a check and reflect for him to hopefully notice his success on the day. I don't think he's going to say, what were people proud of? We're going to have to help him get that right. Okay. And then one last one, and you may have lots of questions or some questions about any of that. This is actually uh, not too mind-blowing, but uh, uh, it, it's in the vein, too, of helping notice the positive. Uh, this is a child that... Uh, became very, very upset, actually a student with autism, uh, that his parent was going on, his family was going on vacation. And normally that would be very exciting, but he likes to maintain routine. He was very upset that he was going to miss school and very upset that he was going to miss Taekwondo. So he had in his mind uh, the three or four negatives why he should not go on vacation. 
And, and that was very salient to him and why he was throwing major fits for his family. Uh, what this child was losing sight of is how much he actually loved going to this place uh, where there's a vacation club, there's unlimited ice cream, there's all sorts of crazy things that he absolutely loves. So we enga- engaged him in a balanced thinking exercise uh, for the child to just weigh kind of the pros and cons. And when he saw that the balance, I literally bought a $10 cheap balance on Amazon. I keep this in my office. I actually use it quite a bit. But we were able to tilt the balance and help him notice the positives. And in that regard, he made the concluding statement that I guess it's going to be okay to go on vacation. All right. I could go on and on with more and more examples, but maybe let me stop and pause because some of your questions may take me to other examples. Some that might be embedded in here and slides I didn't print for you or um, things we can talk about. So, um, yeah. Let me uh, maybe pause for a moment and just give you guys a chance to think. If you'd like to ask any questions, I'm happy to answer them. That's a very good question. One I don't think I'm prepared to answer right now. I mean, I got my things that I go kind of go to as a professional. Um, probably should have been a little bit more prepared with anticipating that. But it's not something I don't mind um, um, trying to find. Like, uh, I know there are manuals because a lot of families during COVID did not come into cognitive behavioral therapists. And, there are ways to be able to do, there's a lot of self-help kind of manual, manuals to help kids with managing worry and anxiety. I think it gets a little bit trickier when we're doing exposure activities, but not impossible. Um, so it's another one of those, if you, if you want that resource, I would probably email me and I'll make sure I come up with something. Or I can send it to you and then you could just... Dis- okay, that's a good idea. Well, that wasn't a good hit rate for questions, right? First one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, no. I think you've asked me before, too, about books. I'm glad. Yeah, that's kind of my reaction to it, Shots. But um, so I think you did a lot of great things. Uh, you're going to get, sounds like you're going to get through the next one again. Is that right? I wonder if you can make a, a positive concluding statement. Of, I think you do right when you leave. You have a permanent product. Yeah. There is exposure activities for kids with all kinds of like... Uh, uh, phobias related to going to dentists and opening their mouth and getting things touched in their mouth and certainly their arms as well. Uh, I don't know if you've engaged in any of that, like where you do the practice and the modeling and um, you can get to the point of even, I mean, obviously don't break the skin, but putting a little mark just to even see how brief so they can make even some more comments about how brief it happens to be. The other thing to do, and I, actually I'm, I'm guessing you've already done this, is we have these great talks um, with kids and prepare them for success. Uh, this is something that we, we try to do in schools as much as possible is now we're about to have the Lyme moment. You want to make sure that you front load them by reminding them about the ways to think about this and all of that. Uh, in addition, being brave is tough. So you want to make sure you attach some sort of behavioral reinforcement, which maybe becomes their focus as well. Remember, worry takes attention. Um, do you guys do all the distraction objects, hold on to the fidgets, all of those things, let mom go first? Well, you don't want to get a shot that's unnecessary, but yes. You do all of that, yeah. Um, I don't know, anyone else want to share their own experiences of how they got their children through their shots? fact that you're still getting through it is great is probably disheartening um does it require a lot of restraint 
Because that's the part that I worry like will create even more anxiety is like all of that physical stuff. So um, I think I would engage in as much positive practice beforehand in trial and conclusion of it not being so bad. Yes. To, to how it, how like being anxious can lead to hyperactivity. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And it's hard for me to understand because I'm not there, so I can't see just hyperactivity because I don't know what to do about it. Or is it you know, I have to see some of that? No, it's a great it's a great question if you guys didn't hear it. So, you know, in, in the face of some sort of anxiety, social anxiety, uh, there's also this behavioral expression of some sort of hy- restlessness, hyperactivity and does one cause the other? Does the other? Who knows? How do I differentiate that? Well, what do we kind of do about that as well? This all falls in, in my mind under the realm of some level of emotional dysregulation. And seemingly every single person in the clinic that I'm working with has some goal related to emotional dysregulation. And that is you feel some sort of heightened emotionality. Okay, Our emotional tank is filled, if not spilling at this moment. And it could be anxiety. Uh, this happens for kids that get, oh, favorite episode or they're with their buddies. They're coming back from phys ed where they've just been running around. Uh, disappointment, anger, all of that stuff. These are all levels of having this high emotionality. And then we're sp- expected to just regulate it. Well, I want to remind everyone, we're not born knowing how to regulate it. So I'm not certain if I can discern at this point what causes what? Is this in fact real ADHD or not? But what I do know is there is some level of dysregulation and I think the focus should be on hand over handing assistance to help him get his response right in that moment. He, I don't expect the child is going to just figure out what they need to do in that moment. So there's going to probably have to be some coaching to help them know what to do in that moment. Um, I, by the way, I say this to school staff, just so you know, um, is this, this is kind of part of my discussion on planned ignoring. Um, often we ignore kids when it comes to the social emotion, not often, but sometimes we ignore planned ignoring when a child is starting to escalate and stuff. It's interesting, when we teach academics, we're willing to give as much hand over hand assistance that's needed to help your kids get their academics right, or in your case, the homework right. Right? You don't get that, let me help you out. We explain, we make sure that they know two plus two is four and not five. But when it comes to social, emotional, and emotional regulation, we don't always give hand over hand assistance. Right? I mean, sometimes in, because of the pace of instruction or we interpret this as behavior problems, hey, clip down your light to yellow light or to red light, or you don't talk to your brother like that, you go up to your room, give me those electronics, right? So we handle it in a very much of a consequence-based kind of model instead of giving the hand-over-hand assistance to make sure they get it right. Now, I don't want to set you up for failure, so one other thought that's kind of going through my mind is the situation you're describing... I don't know enough details of it, but think about this. Think about the situation where you struggle the most. It's their most difficult. That right there is not the time for skill building, okay? Yeah, I wouldn't fault you for doing whatever you gotta do to get your child through that moment. If it's, if it's rescuing them, it's leaving the concert right early, it's corking them with a sucker, a popsicle, whatever, I will never fault you with that. Because you've got to get through the moment. But if we're living the same situation day in and day out, or very regularly, it means our response is clearly not working. Now, where the learning is going to happen is not when they're in the ring with with 
with their, I call it the ring with their heavyweight champion. That moment when their most heightened emotional dysregulation, that's their heavyweight champion. I don't know if you ever thought or considered or know how do you build a boxer? You build a boxer by sparring, by training, and then setting up fights they're guaranteed to win. They go in the ring with the person with the zero wins and 20 loss record, and then the 10 wins and 18 loss record, the lightweight, and then you take on the, the welterweight and the bantamweight, and then one day you have the skill set to take on the heavyweight champion. That's what happens with dealing with anxiety. That dysregulation, it's, that's the top of the ladder, that situation you may have described. But there are a lot of other moments where, you know what, he, I can see him getting antsy and fidgety, and I ask him to sit still, or I tell him to do uh, chair push-ups right now and squeezes, and that gets him settled. I want to reinforce those. That might be step one, step two, until they have the skill set that they can take on their heavyweight champion. So I don't know the cause, but that's kind of the, what would be involved in the solution, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the comment, if you want me to just sum, and I don't know if, I think there's people listening at home too, so just so they can hear. So the comment was about a, a seventh grade child recently diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder uh, with some learning challenges. And the comment was, uh, recently got an IEP. What would be some examples of accommodation supports potentially that could help, that I've seen on IEPs to help individuals like this? So... It's going to be a general answer, and unless you want to get to very specifics about your child, which I don't mind. Um, I, I'd be interested in what are the sources of the generalized worries. Considering that there are some learning difficulties, I'm trusting that some schoolwork completion, her success, how I'm going to be evaluated in my work is all so sources of anxiety, right? So I think the starting point is probably what you already have are getting because I don't think it would need an IEP otherwise is, is there some sort of educational accommodations that understands her learning challenges and difficulties? Like for instance, some kids get, and I don't know if this is, again, I'm making some assumptions without knowing all the details. So if you're not getting this, it, I trust the CSE, the team, which you're a part of. Um, so don't feel bad if this isn't there, but you might want to have a further discussion. So, um, you know, is she in a classroom that offers some other supports like a co-taught teacher or access to uh, a resource room period or someone where someone can clarify and explain further the stuff she does not know at a pace that she can handle? Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So well, I think, believe it, that I do believe the edu this, this will not be the first time that educators in a public school setting have, have had a student like your daughter. So I would want to feel confident that they're, they're going to, first of all, implement the IEP. The, the challenge, if you didn't hear, is that her, her daughter was actually at a private school where, listen, I, I've seen private schools be very advantageous in terms of the 
the smaller um, groups, for sure, that could be very, very helpful. Um, but I think what's even more telling is when you said, when she actually worked one-on-one -on -one in the mornings with a special educator, they were able to present things in a way that this, this person understood me and I understand what they're saying. That's the part that we're missing. If you were to say she was going back to the private school, uh, I would either be adamant that these are the supports that she needs, and if you're not going to do it, then this is not the right placement, but the fact that you said that she's coming to district, uh, I think the next step for you is, um, I, I'm doing a summer preparatory workshop. I'm not telling you to go to that or her staff, but one of the first things I'm going to talk about is the importance of getting to know your students sooner than later. When I go to a team and I do a consult for a child who's struggling in October and I say, hey, so what have you guys tried? If, the, if I get a group of educators that say, hey, well, you know, we haven't really done anything yet because we thought we'd take the first four weeks of the school year to get to know her, that's not good enough, okay? There's someone, if your daughter came to the school district tomorrow, they don't know her. But guess what? Someone knows her very well, and that is you. So I think it's going to be really critical for you to initiate that meeting, ideally prior to the school year, uh, if not right near the beginning of the school year, to kind of share what you know, what's needed. Um, but if you've had a CSE meeting in IEP uh, in this district, I know the special ed team is going to know, know her. So first thing is that smaller level of instruction is going to provide her with increased confidence. It's going to close the educational gap for sure. Now, the other thing is anxiety happens because something else isn't. Now, I imagine there's a lot of team members, including yourself and some of you guys with your own kids that offer your kids reassurance, right? It's going to be okay. Hey, we're going to get through this one day at a time. Hey, you did it, right? You offer a lot of reassurance. Continue to do that. Just remember, reassurance, in my opinion, is a prompt. Reassurance is a prompt. Remember, every prompt in this world is, is done because your child isn't doing something. What is your child not doing if you're providing reassurance? They're not self-reassuring themselves. We're not born knowing how to self-reassure, but that is definitely a buildable skill. I'll give you one more tip, okay, and then we gotta wrap up. But the tip is this. A good way to build self-reassurance for your child is continue to be the support you are, but instead of saying those comforting words, Say to your child, hey, what do you think I'm about to tell you? And if they can now anticipate, you're going to say I'm going to be fine. You're going to tell me I'm going to get through this or it's not going to take so long. Guess what? What is my self-reassuring thoughts? It's just all the things my mom used to tell me. Okay? Self-reassurance is often parents' thoughts, at least at first. Supportive parents' thoughts. So if they can now anticipate what you're going to say, then, then I think they're on the steps towards self-reassuring. Now, if they can't get it, you offer them those words anyway. All right, I'm happy to stick around to stock because I think there might be a few more details. And in fact, I'm happy to do that with all of you. If I time things right, you know, stick around a little bit longer, everything will be done when I get home. So, hey, I'm, I'll stick around. Okay, thank you guys so much for today and your attention and uh, the invitation to come here. Yeah. We really appreciate it. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who, uh, who was here tonight. Uh, like Dr. Mike and Bob said, he'll be here for a little bit if you have a further question. For those folks at home, thank you so much for tuning in. And certainly, we will post the PowerPoint online as well as Dr. Mike and Bob's email if you had a specific question for him. So thank you so much again. And we will continue to offer more parent nights like this on a variety of topics moving forward. Much appreciated. Have a great night.